Number 10, Phone Pan Z. During the Ninja Steel season of the show that ran in 2017 and 2018, the Rangers were forced into a gladiatorial style intergalactic tournament called Galaxy Warriors. They faced many competitors who were trying to kill them and steal the Ninja Power Stars. Oh, that, that sounds important. One who actually came pretty close to besting the team was the contestant named Phone Pan Z. As is implied by the name, he is a hybrid of a chimpanzee and a phone. Although he is a capable hand-to-hand -hand combatant and can unleash basher bots upon his enemies, his real strengths come from the deception skills that his phone parts grant him. Not only can he use the speaker in his mouth to unleash a massive sonic boom that would send his enemies flying, but he could mimic voices with uncanny accuracy. This allowed him to imitate a ranger and then call up one of their teammates, who he would then draw into a trap and attack. The host of the Galaxy Warriors, Cosmo Royale, then used a gigantify machine to turn Phone Pan Z giant, forcing the Rangers to use their Zords to form the Ninja Steel Megazord and the Bull Rider Megazord. They defeated the giant monster who promptly exploded. Okay, that's weird, but I think I'm following this okay so far. As long as the villains don't get any stranger than that, I should be fine. Number 9, Typeface. Oh come on, that's a keyboard! After the Ninja Steel season, fans of the Power Rangers were given the Super Ninja Steel season. Like Phone Pan Z, Typeface is a contestant in the Galaxy Warriors. He could summon basher bolts and was an expert fighter, being able to hold his own against multiple Rangers at once, which is really impressive because he doesn't look like he'd be super mobile. He can fire lasers out of his hands and space bar, which were powerful enough to incapacitate all six of the Rangers. And he is also a teleporter, but his real strength strength is more tech based, which yeah, I should hope so, otherwise the theming is kinda weird. He has a virus gun, which can infect the weapons of the rangers, making them unable to effectively fight his with their element star ninja fire attack. The rangers were eventually able to repair their weapons and attack Typeface, and Cosmo Royale repeated his strategy of growing Typeface into a giant monster who had to be defeated by a megazord. However, this was a difficult task due to him being able to use his teleportation abilities to dodge several attacks and gain the upper hand for a while. However, the rangers were eventually able to take him out with the Ninja Blaze Megazord's Ranger Blast final attack. Hmm, yeah, you gotta watch out for those. Number 8. Pandemonium. In the Mighty Morphin comic series, the new Green Ranger destroyed the Green Chaos Crystal, which left the infamous Lord Zed incapacitated. As he recovered in the Moon Palace, Zed's cronies discussed their options about what their next course of action should be. They considered eliminating their boss, but decided against it, as it would require them to grow spines, and instead decided to try and capture the Green Ranger so that when Lord Zed awoke, he would have someone to vent his frustrations on other than them. They created a creature called Pandemonium. Pandemonium, who was of course a panda, who had super strength, as well as an entire arsenal of spears and axes sticking out of his back, which he could remove and use against the team. He could also give off massive energy blasts, which damaged anyone caught in his vicinity. The panda gave the team some trouble, but was defeated when the new Green Ranger showed up and used his dragon dagger to destroy the creature. Zed's cronies watched from afar and bemoaned that they had chosen too cute and cuddly of an animal to be their agent of destruction. Number 7. Hori King. In the Power Rangers comic series, the Rangers and Zordon are not on good terms, as the Rangers have taken off in a ship searching for a means of defeating the Imperials in deep space with the evil Lord Dracon serving as their guide. Things soon start going south when their ship stops working and they discover that they have been boarded by a frightening race of alien energy draining vampires known as the Horrid and their king. The Horrid were once a peaceful race of people, but their planet was destroyed when they attempted to control reality trapping them in between dimensions, neither alive or dead. They learned that they could absorb other beings' life forces in order to take on a physical form. The Horrid King led them across the galaxy, looking for beings that they could absorb before coming across the rangers. The King and all of his people cannot be harmed by physical attacks when in a non-physical form, as all weapons simply pass through them. However, if they have fed enough to take on a physical form, they become vulnerable. This weakness was exploited by Dracon, who killed the Horrid King and took his place as the Horrid's leader. At number 6 is Victoria Murdoch. The villainess known as the Asbestos Lady had a burning grudge against the original Human Torch. To face the fiery hero, she decided to deck herself out in a fireproof asbestos suit, making her nearly invincible to the Human Torch. But she craved more power and tried to strong arm her scientist friend, 
Fred Raymond into enhancing her asbestos abilities. The Torch kept a close eye on Raymond's home and thwarted her plans. Fueled by revenge, the asbestos lady caused a train wreck to off the Raymonds, but their son Thomas survived unscathed. She tracked his fire resistant talents as he joined a circus act, but again, the Torch foiled her plans by melting her boots to the road. Then in 1947, her twin brother Murdoch met his end at the hands of the Torch and Toro. Abestos Lady resolved to wipe them out as she lured them into traps, inducing an asbestos lined net, but they survived. But despite her escape attempts and alliances with villains, the Asbestos Lady ended up behind bars, vowing vengeance. However, she eventually succumbed to mesothelioma probably due to all that asbestos exposure. At number five is Fred Myers, the Boomerang Man. Have you ever heard of a villain who started off as a pro baseball player? No? Well, let me introduce you to Boomerang, AKA Fred Myers. He's not your typical bad guy. You see, back in the day, he was swinging for the fences in the baseball world. But then he got suspended for taking bribes. That's right, he went from hitting home runs to hitting people. But wait, it gets crazier. A criminal organization came knocking on his door and Fred joined the dark side as an assassin. He worked for some big names like Justin Hammer, the Kingpin, the Masters of Evil, and even the Sinister 12. Then he had a brief stint as a hero during the Marvel Universe Civil War, going by the name Outback. But of course, he couldn't resist the allure of the criminal life for long. Now he's a part of the Thunderbolts, a team of reformed supervillains. Boomerang's not just any run of the mill bad guy either. He's a sharpshooter with a lethal arsenal of customized boomerangs from explosives to tear gas. So the next time you see a baseball game, remember that not all athletes stick to playing fair. At number four is Leapfrog. An unusual and relatively obscure villain in the Marvel Universe offers not one, but two intriguing origin stories. First, we have Vincent Petilio, a struggling inventor who decided to take matters into his own hands. Frustrated with his lack of success, he crafted a frog like suit equipped with electric leaping coils. Sadly for him, Daredevil foiled his criminal aspirations not once, but twice. And later, Iron Man joined the party, ensuring Petilio's stint in jail. Fast forward to post-prison life where financial hardship followed the tragic loss of Petilio's wife to cancer. His son Eugene took up the mantle as Frogman, causing some father-son superhero drama. But then when the villainess White Rabbit resurfaced, Petilio went undercover to help the police, leading to a unique family showdown against the White Rabbit. Next, let's talk about Buford Lang, a bad dad who stumbled into a leapfrog costume. His encounter with Daredevil on a rooftop took a shocking twist involving his own son Timmy, who didn't want to see Daredevil hurt. This electrifying turn of events led to Lang's unfortunate demise until he was eventually resurrected, of course. This is comic books. At number three, meet the Sultan of Sauce, the Condiment King. If you've seen the Lego Batman movie or the Harley Quinn animated series, you've encountered this master of salvary savagery. In the Lego movie spinoff, he joined the Joker's gang attacking Gotham, and in Harley Quinn, he's Poison Ivy's Kite Man rival. Yep, the Condiment King is a real DC villain, though he's not exactly keeping Batman up at night. Batman the animated series introduced him where he fell under Joker's control, who made him wield condiments as weapons. Before his spicy turn, he was Buddy Sandler, a comedian brainwashed by the Joker to threaten people with ketchup and mustard at a fancy restaurant. In the comics, his real name was Michelle Mayo, a name that doesn't exactly command respect. But in Birds of Prey number 37, he concocted a poison that sent Blue Beetle, Black Canary, and Robin into anaphylactic shock. Deliciously evil, am I right? At number two, Clock King's comic history is a curious tale of obscurity turned cool. See, back in the 1960s, he made his debut in the world's finest comics number 111, a crook who really, really loved clocks. And well, that's about it. Over the next two decades, he only popped up a couple more times in some of the world's finest backup stories. One of those tried to give him a backup story, but it was really only a half-hearted attempt at best. However, the 1980s came to the rescue with the creation of the Injustice Gang. This group of largely forgotten villains, formed for laughs in the Justice League comics, breathed new life into characters like Clock King. But the real turning point for him was Batman the Animated Series. See, they took this obscure clock-loving crook and turned him into something awesome. The updated designs and new motivations struck a chord with fans and suddenly, the Clock King was Vogue. At number one is Polka Dot Man. His mom was a scientist obsessed with superheroes and she decided to take a leap into the unknown. See, she worked at Star Labs, and in her quest to turn her kids into caped crusaders, she exposed Abner to an interdimensional virus. Now what happened next is something like out of a horror sci-fi flick. See, Abner's skin starts sprouting these weird glowing polka dots and lumps, and it's not a fashion statement. Some of his siblings, 
they didn't make it. They paid the price for their mom's experiments. But Abner, well, he survived, but at a cost. He had to expel those polka dots twice daily just to prevent the virus from munching on his insides. Now what's more is because of his mom's twisted experiments, Abner got PTSD. He sees his mom's face in every person he looks at, like an unending horror show in his head. And while he might not be too fond of unaliving people, he's got a twisted way to motivate himself. See, he imagines his targets as his own mother. Eventually, he ended up behind bars in Belle Reve Penitentiary, but he would eventually go on to be recruited by by Amanda Waller as part of a new squad, and I'm sure you all know the rest. Number 10, Killer Moth. Killer Moth, unlike a lot of the characters on this list, isn't really that powerful, but that's not what makes them underrated and in need of more attention. Killer Moth is just Fun. Drury Walker first appeared all the way back in Batman number 63 from February of 1951, and his whole shtick is just goofy. While other characters have taken their inspiration from having similar backstories to the Batman, the Killer Moth wanted to be the criminal's version of Batman, so he got himself a moth signal and a moth mobile and the name of Killer Moth. Ah! So scary! Not really. He even set up a false identity as millionaire philanthropist Cameron Van Clear. In that form, he became friends with Bruce Wayne, which is actually interesting. I doubt he even knew about Bruce's hobby of bat cosplay, but meanwhile, he promoted himself to Gotham's criminals using his identity as Killer Moth, giving them each an infrared moth signal to call him to their aid. Now he didn't really fight for them. Instead, he kind of just became the distraction for the authorities so the real criminals could get away. You see why he really didn't become so popular? It's just kind of hilarious, and although his character has evolved a bit by then, no one has taken him that seriously, so just like Kite Man, he needs his time to shine. Number 9, Calendar Man. Julian Gregory Day, whose name is a pun on the Julian and Gregorian calendars, has an obsession with dates. Committing crimes that always have a relationship to the date that they are being committed on usually covering the major holidays. Like most of the messed up members of the Batman's rogues gallery, Calendar Man has a rough childhood. His parents neglected him, which almost resulted in his passing away from days of exposure, which in turn resulted in his complete psychotic obsession of days and holidays. I don't know how those two mix, that's just how it goes. First appearing in Detective Comics number 259 in September 1958, Calendar Man was a bit sillier, using different costumes to commit crimes based on the days of the calendar, like dressing as an Indian magician representing the monsoon season. But after the crisis on Infinite Earths, Calendar Man was barely used and got a great revamp by writer Jeff Loeb in Batman The Long Halloween. In this new version, Calendar Man was institutionalized in Arkham Asylum and was deemed as an insane, ruthless criminal with abbreviations of the months tattooed around his head in a circle with no silly costumes or ridiculous crimes. Just his name. Number 8. Wrath. A young, successful, and secretly entirely evil CEO, Wrath is capable of being both Batman and Bruce Wayne's number one nemesis and antithesis, and yet almost no one cares or knows about him. Wrath first appeared back in 1984 as basically an anti-Batman. And while that may sound like a lazy writing exercise and may make you think he won't be popular, he did it before the major villain Prometheus ever even conceived of the idea. Wrath's parents were two burglars who were accidentally taken from this plane of existence by a young police officer who stumbled upon them and thought they were robbing their own house. As you can imagine, this is quite the villain backstory to turn a young Wrath completely against the law. He then dedicated his whole existence to to going against them. Wrath even ended up training a young ward of his own named Elliot Caldwell, who you might have guessed became his version of Robin. Caldwell eventually takes on the role of Wrath himself, filling in his mentor's shoes, and he remained as the villain after the New 52 reboot. And yet, Wrath is nowhere to be seen, and you basically probably never heard of him, and you probably never will. Number 7, Colonel Sulphur. This Denny O'Neill created villain from the 70s is an espionage expert with weaponized artificial hands a tool he has used to commit very espionage type crimes. He's very Bond villainy if we're being honest. Colonel Sulphur has a strange sunlight fixation, meaning he only allows himself to act on his violent urges in the quote, morning's earliest minutes, which is one hell of a specific yet very obscure time frame for criminal activity. He did actually prove to be a bit more of a threat though when he joined the Army of Crime. When the Army of Crime's activities were challenged by Batman and Superman, Sulphur 
Topher used an alien weapon to trap Superman and Batman in a timeless dimension. Sulphur used stolen tools of the trade to take over Gotham City, but as you may suspect, he was soon stopped by Batman and Superman, who had escaped from the timeless dimension. These things happen, man. They're superheroes. Sorry, dude. Number six, Armageddon. Armageddon is actually a legacy villain, but despite the fact that there have been multiple Armageddons, it's still likely not a name that most would be super familiar with. I mean, you know the word Armageddon, but I don't know if you really know the character. The original Armageddon fought alongside Germany during World War II on the side of the Axis. He was first introduced in the 1970s in issue number 234 of the original Wonder Woman comic. His son and his granddaughter thereafter would also end up taking up the villainous mantle of Armageddon, explaining his strength and theirs originating from being descended from the mythical beasts known as ogres. I mean, that'll make you strong. Ogres are definitely super strong. Number five, Darano. Donna Troy always seems to have an interesting and kind of ever-changing origin story in the comics, as each DC reboot seems to revamp the origins of where the original Wonder Girl came from. During the Wonder Woman series that started in 2011, the story once again got a refresh of sorts when Darano was introduced. Darano was once the lover of Hippolyta, who after being turned into an old crone and drained of all her youth and her beauty, decided instead to live out her days mostly in seclusion. When she learned that Hippolyta had a child with Zeus, the baby that would one day grow up to become Wonder Woman, she set out to make a better heir for the people of Themyscira, spiteful of her former lover and queen. Thus, Donna Troy was created. Darano helped Donna to vie for the throne, and the two almost succeeded in usurping Wonder Woman's position as inheritor. Number four, the children of Ares. Ares has honestly a lot of children, and most of them have beef with Diana, to be honest, but this group of them are specifically known as the children of Ares. Not just a descriptor of their familial connections, but instead a name for their group as villains. They are a team of children and villains created by Gail Simone and Bernard Chang, who first appeared appeared in the 2006 run of Wonder Woman in issue number 39. They were only around for a few issues, but were sired by Ares and birthed by magically impregnated Amazonian women. These children challenged Diana using their mind control abilities and manipulation skills to basically discredit her, tarnishing her reputation as the hero known as Wonder Woman. Number three, Troya. Donna Troy is well known for being a member of the Teen Titans, a superhero, and basically Wonder Woman's kid sister. Or at least, she used to be Wonder Woman's kid sister. She's kind of like an adult herself now. While she has made tons of appearances, the reason I included her here was actually because I wanted to talk about a lesser known aspect of the character. That she has in the past, or rather in a future, been Wonder Woman's greatest enemy. How did this come to pass? Well, this version of Donna Troy is actually from an alternate future. Far in the future, this version of Donna is a villain who goes by the name of Troya, and has done so for over a millennia. Troya actually is an uncommon name for Donna to use. She's used it before in other versions of the character, but this one, whoo, it uses it in a pretty deadly way. In her reality, many of her fellow Titans perished, and Donna came to the realization that she was basically made solely to be a weapon, embracing this as her destiny. She killed many villains and heroes alike, including Diana herself, for her part in the lie of what Troya believed she once was as Donna Troy. Because, you know, Wonder Woman was like, love and all of that good stuff, and Troya basically ended up realizing like, nah, that's all BS. Number two, Earl of Greed. While Mars, also known as Ares, is very well known in the comics, some of his agents have fallen by the wayside since his days and their introduction and the old days of comics. Originally, Ares was known by the alternative name of Mars, the Roman name for the god of war. And after he was first introduced to us in Wonder Woman issue number one, we'd also come to be introduced to his cohorts and agents, the Duke of Deception, the Count of Conquest, and of course, the Earl of Greed. The Earl of Greed took on other names throughout his appearances in history, I believe, including that of the leader of the Third Reich and Dr. Prexy Deacon. The Earth II original version of the Earl of Greed made less than a handful of appearances in the comics, first appearing in issue number two of Wonder Woman back in 1942. Hence why you probably haven't seen him for a while. Maybe these guys will come back one day though. Maybe they have and I missed it or something, but yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty classic. Number one, the Sovereign. 
The Sovereign is a villain who has only just made his first appearance in Wonder Woman, since this will be a new villain for Tom King's run on Wonder Woman, which was released on the 19th of September of this year, 2023. We don't really know too much about him just yet. Initially, it was believed the Sovereign would be the name of a group opposing Wonder Woman, turning her into a wanted criminal and outlaw in America after the Amazonians' invitation to stay in the nation was basically rescinded. In issue number one of Wonder Woman, we learn that while the Sovereign reigns said group, it is actually not the name of the collective group, but instead a title held by its ruler, the Sovereign, who also comes armed with the Lasso of Lies, which I gotta say I love, which he can use to bend the American people to his will. We also learn that the Sovereign is a title passed down through generations of a family in America, which began with a lord who first traveled to its shores long ago, seeking adventure and fortune. Number 10, Boomerang. Fred Myers was born in Australia, but moved to America when he was but a small child. In America, due to his great love of baseball, he developed an extraordinary pitching arm. He became a professional baseball player in the minor leagues after graduating high school, and a few years later, entered the major leagues. Within a year, he was suspended, though, for accepting bribes. With an arm like that and no job, he was eventually contracted by the subversive criminal organization, the Secret Empire, and offered employment. For him, they designed special weaponry for him to exploit his pitching ability, and he became their special operative, codenamed Boomerang. Why Boomerang? No idea, because he's Australian probably. Now, Boomerang's first fight was actually with the Incredible Hulk, which makes no sense at all. Eventually, he would recalibrate his aspirations and take on more reasonable heroes like Spider-Man, which he did multiple times, but notably as part of the Sinister Syndicate, and he even had his own Sinister Six team. Number nine, White Rabbit. For someone so incredibly inept at committing crimes, White Rabbit sure does have a relatively long history in Marvel Comics. In the beginning, sheltered rich girl Lorena Dodson committed her first crime by ending the life of her 87-year-old arranged husband as she found the trophy wife life boring. She then used her inheritance to buy a bunch of high-tech equipment and, being inspired by Alice in Wonderland, she went off as the villainous White Rabbit. For her first crime, she shall rob a fast food joint. This dastardly crime brought her into confrontation with the most fearsome of heroes, Frogman, and she almost brought him down too if it wasn't for the intervention of Spider-Man, who finished her off with an astounding amount of ease. Spider-Man has actually defeated her on multiple different occasions with the same amount of ease, and she's even been defeated by Mary Jane Watson. Don't even get me started on the amount of animal-themed villains she has allied with. In fact, she's allied with a lot of other low-level villains as well, but never to any amount of great success. She does have a giant, heavily armed robotic rabbit though, and that part that part is kind of cool. Number eight, the Menagerie. The Menagerie is a slightly more recent evil team, showing up for the first time in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, number one, in April of 2014. This was when they tried stealing a valuable decorated egg from an antique store and were pretty easily defeated. So like from the get-go, the impressive feats are on the lower side with this team. In fact, I'd say the most famous thing they've ever done is when they disintegrated Spider-Man's spider suit, making him have to create web underwear for himself. And it's the underwear that is remembered here, not the team. The animal-themed criminal team was created by White Rabbit, who we just talked about, and its members included Hippo, Ox, Gyne, who did the Spider-Man suit disintegrating, a squid, Swarm, and wait for it, Pandamania. Very cool. The Menagerie also is known for trying to rob a club where Nadia Van Dyne was celebrating her birthday with numerous other heroes, which as you can imagine, did not work out well for them. Number seven, Critical Mass. I just want to say that I think Marvel has something against severely overweight people. The amount of supervillains who are just massive is actually ridiculous. We got the Slug, the Blob, the Shadow King, Pink Pearl, the Kingpin too, although that's actually all muscle, and then there's Critical Mass, AKA Arnie Gunderson. Arnie was one of Peter Parker's classmates back in the fourth grade, and eventually he gained the mutant ability to project explosive forces from his fingertips, which is actually a really cool power. But that didn't save Arnie from being just a massive man for seemingly no reason. Together with some other evil mutants, he formed the Band of Baddies, and with a name like that, you know we got some real winners here. The band abducted another explosive mutant named Mary Beck, which brought them into conflict with Wolverine and Spider-Man. Unfortunately for the baddies, one of their number threatened Mary, who then accidentally unleashed her powers, taking out every single one of the villains on this team. And we never saw Critical Mass 
ever again. The end. Lasted three issues of Marvel Comics Presents. That's it. He's gone. Number six, Condiment King. When the villainous Condiment King came on the scene, it was literally on the scene, as he appeared in the animated Batman TV show from 1992. One of the best, honestly. Condiment King was Buddy Stantler, a comedian who was brainwashed by the Joker into becoming a villain. He wields condiment squirters and viciously horrible puns. Stuff like, I knew you'd catch up to me sooner or later, or how I've relished this meeting. Come Batman, let's see if you can cut the mustard. You get the idea, that was stuff like that. The puns get even worse worse in the comics with his real name becoming a pun on its own, Mitchell Mayo. I am not joking. He is not taken seriously by anyone, including all of us. His weapons don't actually project his condiments at a speed fast enough to do anyone harm, but they sure are inconvenient, leaving nasty stains in your superhero costumes. On the other hand, he does potentially have the ability to be able to cause anaphylactic shock if he's battling someone with an allergy. Number five, Flamingo. Eduardo Flamingo, known as Flamingo is a world famous serial taker of life and an assassin. He is well known for a specific thing he does which inspired his sometimes name of the Eater of Faces, which really just explains itself. Eduardo was actually a morally strong advocate and fighter against organized crime, but that all changed when he was captured and underwent forced brain surgery that altered his personality, making him dangerously psychotic. Now the incredibly colorful flamingo is an enforcer and assassin, rocking a very unique look and somehow totally making a pink motorcycle not look silly. He has a dark, unfeeling personality and is an expert marksman which makes up for his lack of powers and makes him a pretty dangerous threat for Batman. He has even temporarily paralyzed Damian Wayne, so think twice before you judge cause he'll chew your face off, literally. Number 4, Lord Death Man. The Japanese crime boss known as Lord Death Deathman has battled Batman both in American comics and in Japanese manga using his powers to seemingly overcome death itself, able to rise from the grave no matter what his injury is. In his first appearance in Batman 180 in May of 1966, he passed away a total of three times using a yogi technique to appear passed away before the final conflict which saw him get struck by lightning and actually pass away. But since then he has actually gained the real real power to come back from the dead, but at the cost of having a bare bone skull for a head. I don't know why. His regenerative abilities are so powerful that his sweet red red is used to create the infamous Lazarus pits that Ra's al Ghul uses to stay young and immortal. One of the first ways Batman defeated Lord Deathman with his new powers is honestly a little out of character for the Crusader. He threw Lord Deathman off a building into the path of an armored car which took the criminal down just long enough for Catwoman to lock him in a safe and then he was shot out into space. And he still, still somehow came back. Number 3, Pig. Professor Pig is a villain that came to be during a time when Batman stories were becoming incredibly dark. And Pig himself has to be one of the darkest villains of that time. His methods completely disgust the Dark Knight and also most of us. He looks like a character straight out of a horror or a slasher movie and his obsession with physical perfection, like the myth of Pygmalion which is where his name comes from, became part of the reason that he turned his victims into his own mind controlled servants called Dolotrons. If his crimes were horrifying enough, then I mean just, just look at him. Yikes. No. Number two, Humpty Dumpty. With his house being demolished, his dog being run over, and his parents being crushed by a Christmas tree on Christmas, things were not looking too great for Humphrey Dumpler. He was mistreated by his grandmother who he was forced to live with and because of his appearance and mental capacity, he was also bullied. Of all things, the last straw for Humphrey was missing a subway train. Humphrey was obsessed with fixing things and since the missing of the subway train, he started going out late at night to disassemble and reassemble mechanical devices which had upset him in some way or another. But since he wasn't very intelligent and all the info he got was from books, the things he fixed and reassembled actually caused a lot of accidents. The first thing was the same train that he missed which then crashed due to his manipulation. Now going by Humpty Dumpty, he was tracked down by Batgirl who dislocated her shoulder trying to save him. Humpty fixed her shoulder but then he also revealed that he had evolved from disassembling devices to disassembling and reassembling 
people. Namely, his grandmother who he believed to have been broken and in need of repair. So he took her apart, then attempted to sew her back together again with bootlace. That got dark. And in at number one today, it's Cornelius Sturk. Cornelius Sturk is one of those villains that you don't hear about much, but is one of the more gruesome and terrifying members of Batman's rogues gallery. Sturk suffers from delusions which make him believe that he requires the nutrients of a human heart in order to stay alive. And not just any heart. Specifically, Cornelius believes that the heart is the most nutritious when it is full of norepinephrine, a natural hormone that secretes when a person is terrified, as well as adrenaline. So he uses his unexplained psionic ability to mentally make people perceive him as someone else, which other than allowing him to break out of Arkham Asylum, the first time also allowed him to get close to his victims and then completely terrify them in the most insane ways before he quickly ends them and partakes in a nice old hearty meal. Pun intended. I think the interesting thing about Sturk though is that he is actually really effective at what he does, being able to evade Batman and even render him unconscious on one occasion. Number 10, Angleman. You may have forgotten about Angleman and his angler, but don't worry, I'll make sure you never forget. Angleman has never been considered an A-list villain, likely because he has such a ridiculous name. Although hey, at least it does begin with an A. And because he often fights with what looks like some kind of protractor, cause I mean, Angles, get it? Angle man. But his angler, as it's known, is actually a very powerful piece of equipment that can be used to manipulate space and time. Although I'm sure it could be used as a ruler or to help measure angles in a pinch as well. Bonus. Since his introduction as Angelo Bend, a brilliant and often technologically capable criminal who sometimes dressed up like a stage magician, he has been rebooted and is now known for being Vandal Savage's son. That's an angle of this character we hadn't seen before. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not make sure you check out our other playlist? Number 9, Grail. Grail is the powerful daughter of Darkseid and the Amazonian assassin Myrna. Being that she is both Amazonian by birth and also a new god, she is extremely powerful. She's also been shown to possess magical abilities as well that even allow her to have some power over life and death, successfully bringing back her father, Darkseid, after he died. Initially though, Grail was actually born with her mother's hope that Grail would one day be the key to defeating Darkseid. However, there was also a prophecy that Grail would one day cause, um, great destruction, with this prophecy putting her in danger immediately after she was born. Her mother Myrna gave birth to Grail at the same time that Hippolyta bore Princess Diana, forever entwining their fates, perhaps to one another in some way. I would say so, since Grail's kind of like a dark version of Wonder Woman. But you know, dark version of Wonder Woman if she was Darkseid's daughter. Number 8, Deimos. Deimos is known for being one of the many children of Ares. He first appeared in the original run of Wonder Woman in issue 183. He is the twin brother of Phobos, who created Decay. Together, these brothers attempted to battle Diana after Phobos' plan of using Decay failed. Deimos planned to poison Wonder Woman in battle with his snake-like hair, which infected those it touched with a fear-inducing toxin. In the end, however, Wonder Woman beats him by removing his head with her often underused tiara. That thing is seriously sharp. Deimos also made a somewhat recent reappearance in the comics in issue number 18 of Trinity, entering the Prime Earth continuity in 2018, although he's only appeared in just over a handful of issues since. Number 7, Villainy Incorporated. Villainy Incorporated was a group of women who were former villains of Wonder Woman's trapped together on Transformation Island. Seriously, it's what it's called. Transformation Island is basically like Themyscira's version of, I guess, like a prison, but I think it's more supposed to be for like reforming criminals, hence Transformation Island. They ended up teaming up in order to escape their dismal fate in issue number 28 of the 1942 Wonder Woman series. Together, they manage to capture and overpower Wonder Woman, but as they try to escape, Wonder Woman manages to break her bonds and recapture these rebellious prisoners. While you may recognize some of the villains on on the Villainy Inc. team, not all are easily recognizable. You might know Cheetah, Dr. Poison, or even Giganta, but how about Blue Snowman, Hypnotic Woman, Queen Clea, Zara, or one of my favorites, Evil S. 
Villainy Inc., while initially quite unknown, was recently revived in another incarnation brought together by Hera in 2022's Wonder Woman issue number 784. Legacy numbering, of course. Number 6. Vargoyle Vargoyle, the robotic villain, was one of the early inventions of Scrozzle, but when they discovered something called the Fury Cells, Vargoyle used them to become powerful beyond measure, but also evil. Scrozzle escaped and Vargoyle followed, but eventually agreed to work for Evox in exchange for the Beast Powers upgrade. He was sent after the Rangers, where he feigned being weaker than he was to lull them into a false sense of security before unleashing his full might when they least expected it. He manages to install a memory rewriting machine in a local TV transmitting tower to wipe everyone's memories of his boss's previous attacks. This was undone, and he was destroyed by Devon's Beast X cannon. He was revived by the villain Rijak, who wanted to form an alliance with Evox. This revived Vargoyle had an upgraded golden body, but was also fitted with a compliance collar, which he of course was not thrilled about. His teleportation and weapon summoning powers are handy, and his beast powers give him a real edge between his cheetah speed and gorilla strength, but it was not long before this evil robot was taken out out again, never to be rebuilt. Number 5. Snag Eye This robotic general was created to serve the Void Queen during the second season of Dino Fury. He pledged his eternal loyalty to his queen who demanded that he destroy the rangers. He was given data on the Dino Fury rangers' powers which allowed him to easily defeat the six rangers. The chessboard buckle on his torso contains a pocket dimension which he was able to use to imprison his foes. It was only through the betrayal of the Void Knight that the rangers were able to escape the pocket dimension. He then went up against the Red Ranger, who managed to destroy this robot bishop general using the Dino Knight Strike. So, though he was only in one episode, the fact that he was able to absolutely wipe the floor with the Rangers is pretty impressive. Number 4. Wreckmate Yet another Dino Fury villain. Wreckmate has a lot of themes going on at once. He is a robot, who looks like a rook from a chess set, but he's also a pirate as well as a general. He's just a lot. He's a lot. He was built from the parts of a boat, but became a giant when the Void Knight gave him a Sporix. The Dino Fury Rangers fought him underwater in their Dino Fury Megazord warrior formation, but Wreckmate proved too powerful and was able to defeat the Megazord. Before he could destroy it, he was interrupted by the Moza Razor Zord and presumed dead. He entered a competition with his rival teammate Slither to see who could kill the most Rangers with the loser, having to leave forever, though both were of course unsuccessful and unable to score a point. He served the Void Queen soon after, often clashing with and failing to defeat the Rangers. He has shoulder mounted cannons which can fire cannonballs, energy blasts, lasers, and torpedoes. As a pirate ship themed robot chess piece, he was of course capable of surviving underwater like a submarine, making him just as dangerous on land as he was on water. Number 3. General Tynamon Going back to the Super Ninja Steel season, where the Rangers were involved with the whole Galaxy Warriors thing, Tynamon was the manager of one of the most famous fighters, Brax, but was hiding a small secret. It turns out that Tynamon was in fact a small creature who, embarrassed by his small stature, had constructed a robot body to make himself look bigger. Oh, 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 Tynamon, Tiny Man, I get, I get it, cute. So Tynamon was approached by the villainous Madam Odious, who offered to grow Tynamon on to the size he desired if he and Brax would help her destroy the rangers. He agreed and began a campaign against the heroes. His main weapon is his staff, which can create a protective barrier and can fire a rope line to ensnare and move his enemies. In his final battle with the rangers, he is hit by the Gigantify Ray, letting him finally achieve his dream of being huge. This was short-lived, however, and he was defeated by the Ninja Steel Ultra Zord Blast and died, never really having gotten the opportunity to enjoy his new size. Number 2. King Aradon Our next villain was actually mentioned in passing by Zordon in Power Rangers Zeo all the way back in 1996, but we didn't get to actually meet this king until just last year in the Mighty Morphin comic book series. After Earth was weakened by the Altarian War and Earth's command center was destroyed, the ruler of the Automaton Dominion, King Aradon, decided to take advantage of the situation and send scouts to the command center's ruins where they tried to ambush the Red Ranger. He decided that Earth was ripe for the taking and declared himself ruler with the aid of his general, Count Karnakis. He offered to spare the Green Ranger's life if he stepped aside and allowed the king to destroy Zordon. When the Ranger refused, the two entered a heated battle, which was aided by Red Ranger Rocky, who helped the Rangers triumph over the evil king. Number 1. Leisure. This villain appeared in an episode of the Dino Supercharge season and is vaguely summer themed. There is so much going on visually with this character. She has an ice cream cone for an arm, 
and a lobster claw coming out of a sun hat for the other. She has fish pants and palm trees for eyes. The longer I look at this villain, the more I feel like I'm having a stroke. A hundred thousand years ago, Leisure used her vacation ray on the cavemen, which made them all want to take a break from their work and go on vacation. This got so bad that everyone almost starved as no one was hunting, but she was imprisoned in a cave and the effects of her beam were reversed and as a result, we got hustle culture. She was accidentally released by the rangers and despite looking so odd, turned out to be extremely powerful, beating the seven rangers with ease before firing her vacation beam on the entire planet, making everyone, including the rangers, just stop what they were doing to go on vacation. They eventually attacked Leisure with the Plesio Charge Megazord, but she used her ice cream arm triple scoop twist attack to defend herself. She was eventually defeated and everyone got back to work. Yay. Names like Werner Zittle. Werner was born to a noble house in the tiny nation of Latava with a very real claim to the throne of the country. But his family lost their fortunes and had to flee to Canada. Hell yeah. Here in the Great White North, he became involved with organized crime, using the profits from his illegal activities to finance his return to Vlatava to reclaim his birthright. Though he was hanging around now as a benevolent monarch, he continued to be involved in organized crime using the alias Count Vertigo. Count Vertigo also happened to have a hereditary inner ear defect that affected his balance. So to counter that, Vertigo had a small electronic device implanted in his right temple that compensated for this problem. Now tinkering with the device, Vertigo learned that he was able to affect other people's balance as well, distorting their perceptions so that they could literally not tell up from down, an effect known as Vertigo, and he used this skill to fight Green Arrow. He joined up with the Suicide Squad in issue number 24, using his powers to make people dizzy to his advantage until the squad disbanded for the first time and he became a prisoner of Poison Ivy. He actually has a decently chunky history which which is why he's leading this list. But now it's time to get your thinking caps on because next up is The Thinker. While a lot of superheroes and supervillains have origins that deal with some pretty wacky and wild stuff, Clifford DeVoe's origin almost feels too real. Clifford DeVoe was Keystone City's district attorney during the trial of mob boss Hunk Norvok. DeVoe ended up becoming stumped when the defense put a young woman on the stand and rather than offend the jury by harshly questioning her, he instead decided to withdraw draw his case. This pretty much broke the man and he ended up visiting Norvok while under the influence one night, offering the crime boss his services as a thinker, preparing alibis and legal precedents to keep his organization out of jail. They worked together for a decade, but eventually two of the crime boss's underlings tried to implicate DeVoe in a crime and so he literally dressed up as a cop, went to the police station, stole the evidence and then helped those two underlings make it to the afterlife. Norvok then started to feel threatened by DeVoe and when he went to his house to take him out, DeVoe tricked the guy into firing on himself. Then DeVoe took over. Over the operation. It was then that he became a villain of the Flash, Jay Garrick, having the thinking cap created for him that projected his mental force and improved his already incredibly impressive mind. He would join up with the Suicide Squad in Doom Patrol and Suicide Squad Special number one in March 1988. Next up is a character I think you probably haven't heard of because she's so new that we don't even know her real name yet. Wink here is a kleptomaniac whose true identity we don't know yet, as I just said. She was abducted by the illegal post-human project who were essentially turning people into metahumans. Wink, however, was deemed a failure because she actually hid the fact that she gained the power to teleport. Using her powers, she managed to free another new metahuman who she eventually named Airy, and eventually, sometime after, having a run-in with Amanda Waller, Killer Croc, and KG Beast, the two escaped and joined the revolutionaries. This brought them into direct conflict with the Suicide Squad in Suicide Squad Volume 6 Issue number one, where they were pretty promptly captured by Locke and the squad and forced to become new members of the team. Next up, the Flash villain known as Big Sur was actually born with the unfortunate name of Doofus P. Ratchet and an even more unfortunate malformed brain gland. This caused Doofus to grow to incredibly large and muscular proportions, but left him mentally handicapped. So I just want to say, whoever named him Doofus is really just the worst person than ever and I hope they get their comeuppance. The thing about Big Sur is that he isn't really evil at all in any way, but he is pretty susceptible to being manipulated. Because of that, and because of his incredible
physical strength, he was abducted from his mental hospital home by a group of supervillains who equipped him with a high tech suit of heavy armor created by the Monitor which included a super powerful flying energy mace that also allowed him to fly but also made him even more susceptible to telepathic suggestion. Thanks to that, Big Sur had been used as a henchman or minion by all kinds of supervillains throughout his career including the Rogues, the Injustice Gang, Justice League Antarctica and then he was used by the Suicide Squad in return for a full pardon in Suicide Squad Volume 2 Number 1 where he subsequently got popped. Sorry. Number 6. Big Wheel. Hey! Do you want to be a villain? Great! Just hire another guy to make you a big wheel with rocket launchers and all that stuff on it that you can just ride around in. It's that easy! That's what Jackson Wheel did. Can you guess what he called himself? When he first appeared, Big Wheel used his big wheel to chase and try to take out Rocket Racer while he was mid-fight with Spider-Man. Big Wheel wasn't even facing Spider-Man one-on-one, he just showed up. Just before he was about to get crushed though, Spider-Man pulled Racer out of the way and Big Wheel drove right off the side of a building and right into the Hudson River, ending both Jackson Wheel and his big wheel. All of this because Rocket Racer had some blackmail. That's all it was. Number 5. Hypno Hustler. Just look. Look at this dazzling man. What an icon. The Hypno Hustler made his debut in the 80s, which I hope is not a surprise to anyone. Just look at him. He uses a hypnotic guitar to hypnotize people, wears headphones that stop him from hypnotizing himself, which is hilarious, and has boots that emit knockout gas and have retractable knives in them for some reason. It's a crazy combo. His story involves him performing at the nightclub Beyond Forever, where Peter Parker and his pals just happen to be hanging out. Him and his band use their hypnotic grooves to hypnotize a crowd into giving up their goods. Peter Parker though, being the hero, obviously knows what's going on and changes into his spidey suit. During the fight, he realizes that the headphones are the only thing keeping Hypno Hustler from hypnotizing himself and Spider-Man, he just removes them. That's it and the fight's over. Number four, the headmen. Sometimes it just takes the smallest of things to bring people together. And while that may sound like an extremely beautiful sentiment, I'm saying it in relation to the villainous team known as the headmen, who seem to have come together just because each of their powers revolve around their heads in one way or another. And it's honestly, kind of unsettling in my opinion. Bonded together through their weird heads, these scientists sought out world domination, bringing them into conflict with the Defenders, She-Hulk, and of course, Spider-Man. The quartet consisted of Arthur Nagin, their leader, who had his head transplanted onto the body of a gorilla for some reason, Ruby Thursday, who replaced her own head with an organic computer capable of changing shape, which is actually really cool, Gerald Morgan, aka Shrunken Bones, accidentally shrank his own skeleton, including his skull so he basically just has really baggy skin, which is very creepy, and Chandu the Mystic's head had been transplanted by Nagin onto a number of different bodies through his time, making him actually quite versatile. Number three, Sly. A chemical engineer turned super thief, decked out in a super slippery suit, Jalome Bleacher created a chemical coating that basically eliminated the friction between an object and any surface it came into contact with, which, not even joking here, that could be really, really useful. Like, good job, man, that would work really well in the real world. Too bad the company that he worked for closed their R&D department and Jalome had to find a way to independently fund his project. Honestly, I would just find another company who wanted to fund me, but then I wouldn't appear on a list of people you've never heard of. And that is a goal of mine. He created a suit with the chemical and used his slippery abilities to rob banks and try to destroy his old boss's business. His only other notable mentions were his midlife crisis and his eventual passing into the afterlife in a side story of the Civil War event where he was attacked from behind for refusing to side with crime boss Hammerhead. I guess you could say that they had some friction. Sorry. Number 2. Spider Side Sony's animated Spider-Verse films have not only achieved tremendous success, but have also popularized the concept of multiverse storytelling, encouraging audiences to embrace innovative takes on Spider-Man's character. Within this realm of creative exploration, Spider Side emerges as a rather obscure figure originating from the controversial Clone Saga. In that tangled web of narratives, Spider Side assumes the role of a perplexing third party alongside Peter Parker and Ben Riley 
casting doubt on the true identity of the authentic Spider-Man. Now as the story unfolds, Spider-Side's transformation takes a dark and pretty unsettling turn when he evolves into a molecular monstrosity that bears a closer resemblance to the grotesque shape-shifting abilities of Carnage rather than the iconic traits of Spider-Man himself. His character complicated the already pretty complex story, but he was also actually pretty cool, and I always wondered if we would see him again. And we have with the opening up of the Spider-Verse. Yay! Number one, Stegron. In the world of Spider-Man, the lizard was born from Dr. Kurt Connors' experiments with reptile DNA. However, if you ever wondered what would transpire should Connors delve into the realm of dinosaur DNA, Vincent Stegron, known as Stegron the Dinosaur Man, provides the very answer you would expect. After a fateful journey to the Savage Land, Connors embarks on a scientific endeavor that basically creates the exact same lizard villain, but as a humanoid Stegosaurus. Notably, Stegron possesses raw power that technically actually surpasses other animal-based villains like the lizard and the rhino. He has crossed paths with formidable adversaries such as Venom on multiple occasions and even forged a not at all surprising partnership with the lizard in the Marvel team-up series. Yet, it's his untamed and wild nature that has occasionally posed challenges for the character. But also, he's a Stegosaurus. I see why I didn't catch on. Number 10, Emperor Marco Regnos. Marco Regnos is a pretty spooky looking Sith Lord and Emperor. He battled Sith Lord Simus to become the new ruler of the Sith Empire, and take for himself the title of Dark Lord of the Sith. In his battle against Simus, he defeated him by separating his head from his body. Regnos was a manipulative sort as Emperor, and managed to hold on to his rule for hundreds of years by pitting his rivals against one another, thereby eliminating them as threats to his own rule. Even after his death, Regnos' presence was felt, and he reappeared as a force ghost, informing those who fought over his position that only the most worthy would succeed him. Millennia later, an attempt was actually made to even resurrect Ragnos using energy pulled from the Force through various Force nexuses found throughout the galaxy. And this attempt actually almost succeeded. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you think to yourself, man, I wish they did more Star Wars content, guess what? We have done some of that. You can go check out our Star Wars playlist for even more. Number 9. Savage Opress. Savage Opress is an interesting figure. He first appeared in Star Wars The Clone Wars. He is the younger brother of Darth Maul, who, like his brother, would also become a Sith Lord. However, he was also a Knight Brother as well on his home world. As a Knight Brother, he was chosen by Asajj Ventress to become her mate, pledging himself fully to her, and being bent by the Knight Sisters' magics to obey her. To prove his loyalty to her, he even murdered his own brother. Not Darth Maul, of course, but instead, his brother Feral. Eventually, Opress would escape Ventress's control, breaking the spell that the Night Sisters had cast over him, and breaking off from both Ventress and his master, Count Dooku. He would then go on to join up with Darth Maul, who eventually took him on as his own apprentice. Number 8, Darth Plagueis. Did you ever hear of the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? I thought not. It's not a story the Jedi would tell you. Darth Plagueis was the Sith Master of Darth Sidious, who many of course know more commonly by his other name, Emperor Palpatine. Plagueis himself had an obsession that runs all the way back to actually the creation of the Sith, and in fact could be cited as kind of the reason for the initial split in the Force. He wanted to discover the secret to eternal life, and eventually developed somewhat of an ability to prevent death and create even life. However, this ability would not save him in the end, as his apprentice, Darth Sidious, would eventually betray him, killing him in his sleep so that he might become the new master, taking Plagueis' power for himself. Plagueis is first mentioned in the prequel film Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Here, Emperor Palpatine tells Anakin the legend of Plagueis as he attempts to kind of lure him to the dark side. Although right after that, Anakin's basically like, I think this guy's a Sith Lord. <laughs> Here, Emperor Palpatine refers to his former master as Darth Plagueis the Wise. It was likely because of Plagueis' pursuit of knowledge in bioengineering that Palpatine himself was in a fashion able to prolong his own life. Although he too would obviously fail to become truly immortal, at least as far as we know. I hope that's where it stays. <laughs> I hope he's gone. <laughs> Oh my goodness, could you imagine Emperor Palpatine just comes up again and we're like, oh my gosh, this guy. Number 7, Darth Malgus. Darth Malgus was originally known by his given name, Veridun. As Veridun, he was raised in a part of space that was loyal to the Empire. And when his Force sensitivity first manifested, when he uh, killed a servant, he was sent to the Sith Academy for further training. Which honestly makes a lot of sense. If you know the Force kind of seems to be strong with you and then you kill someone, definitely time for the Sith Academy. He first appeared in the Deceived 
footage trailer for the video game Star Wars The Old Republic. Following his training, he became a Sith warrior, serving in the Imperial Army. As an apprentice to Darth Vindican, he took the name of Darth Malgus for himself. After suffering a dramatic defeat and injury on Alderaan, he was forced to permanently wear a respirator. Initially, his attempt to invade Alderaan had actually been successful, with him actually launching a pretty efficient surprise attack. But afterwards, the Republic managed to push back the Sith in response with their own successful counterattack. So, and that's where he got pretty badly injured. Next up, we have the original leader of the original Suicide Squad created by Amanda Waller, who can use pyrokinesis to get this generate a literal flaming size scimitar that can open dimensional portals and cut through basically anything. His name is Raza Katua, aka Rustum. Raza first ever appeared in the first ever Suicide Squad comics as a member of a villain group operating out of Iran and the fictional country of Karak. He became an enemy to the United States after his family accidentally passed away during an attack and this naturally made him an enemy to the Suicide Squad. In original continuity, Rustum and Rick Flagg went through the Psy Scimitar's dimensional portal and ended up trapped with dinosaurs and all this junk and they fought alongside each other but turned on each other in the end with Rick coming out on top. But in Prime Earth continuity, Rustin was captured by the US government and forced to be the field leader of the first Suicide Squad created by Amanda Waller. After the team failed, Rustin and the rest of the team were imprisoned in a super secret prison hidden from the rest of the world until Maxwell Lord found the team and used them to fight both the Justice League and the current Suicide Squad, with Rustin escaping and vowing revenge on Waller. Of all the characters on this list, I think the character of Velvet may be the most unique. Velvet first appeared in 2023 in Unstoppable Doom Patrol number 2, and while there's no better way to say this, Velvet is a worm, or a worm-like metahuman. So basically, Velvet was a member of Task Force X's espionage unit and was given orders by Peacemaker to infiltrate the Doom Patrol. Velvet has the ability to create human constructs who go on to grow a conscience, which is then used by Task Force X. So when we see Velvet for the first time, he seemed to be the symbiotic pet of a kid called Worm. Worm is rescued by the Doom Patrol during a fight with a giant robot, which was set up by Peacemaker. Maker. He is invited to the Doom Patrol's headquarters and Worm begins to want to be a part of the Doom Patrol. Peacemaker threatens to use the bomb implant to blow Worm up, but before he does, Worm basically asks the Doom Patrol to take care of his pet, Velvet. Then Worm gets popped. But the mission is still a success because now Velvet has infiltrated the Doom Patrol proper. I don't know about you, but that's actually kind of genius and really, really cool. Next up is Eve Eden. Eve Eden was just a girl with a cool name who grew up in Kansas with her mom, dad, and her brother. That is, until her mother Maureen introduced Eve and her brother to the land of the Nightshades, where Maureen had been the queen until she was banished by a villain called Incubus. Maureen received word that Incubus had been wiped out and she took her children to her homeworld, but Incubus's passing was actually just a trap by Incubus himself. They were attacked with Larry, Eden's brother, being captured and Maureen being mortally wounded. Now because of her origins, Eve had the power to become a living shadow and open portals to any location she could see in her mind, and Maureen pushed her to master these powers to one day rescue her brother, Larry. Eve returned to the Land of the Nightshades a bunch of times to try and rescue her brother, but she could not fight Incubus. Inspired by superheroes, Eve decided that she needed experience to fight Incubus, and so she dropped out of college and moved to Washington, D.C. in order to become a legitimate superhero, approaching King Faraday of the Central Bureau of Investigation. And and offering her services. After some time with the CBI, Nightshade was later introduced to Amanda Waller, who asked her to become a member of the first ever Task Force X. Nightshade agreed on the condition that she could use the team for one more personal mission, but I'm pretty sure she hated every second that she spent on that team. Now, the earliest appearances we have of the demonic being known as the Nightmare Nurse came in a very innocent seeming way, sort of. Working as a housekeeper named Asa for a woman named Alice Winter in the House of Mystery. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, Alice became pretty ill and Asa knew that there was no way to actually cure her. So what did she do? Well, since Nightmare Nurse was in need of a new host body, since her current body was becoming old and decrepit, she decided that it would be best for her to just possess Alice's body instead. Alice's body now became Asa's as the Nightmare Nurse, the healer from hell. This demon was essentially forced by the gods Apollo and Panacea to take a Hippocratic Oath. Nightmare Nurse 
is essentially a magical healer. She is capable of using her magical abilities to heal a patient suffering from basically any condition, whether it be spiritual, physical, and or psychological in nature. Her first introduction was in Justice League Dark where she was summoned by Zaytana in order to save the Phantom Stranger's life. She became a member of a Peacemaker ran splinter team of the Suicide Squad during Suicide Squad Volume 7 Number 6 when the main team got stuck on Earth 3 and this team got wiped out on their first mission in Swamp Thing Number 8. Speaking of characters who just have wild origins, our second to last Suicide Squad member today is Lord Satanus. Lord Satanus was a sorcerer who came from more than one million years in the future when human society had, for some reason, reverted back to a medieval mystical world. His main rival at that time was Ambra, ruler of the earth and possessor of the potent runestone of Merlin. Satanus led a revolution against Ambra and his daughter Serene, who also sought the runestone. Ambra was defeated, but in his dying breath, he sent the runestone to a random time in the past. Satanus and Serene decided to co-rule together and both found a spell to travel back in time to search for the runestone. And they both traveled to the 20th century where Lord Satanus became an enemy to Superman. That was back in 1982 and his last appearance was in Crisis on Infinite Earths number 10 back in January of 1986. But his time on the Suicide Squad came as a much more recent surprise in Suicide Squad volume 5 number 45 in October of 2018 to bolster up the Suicide Squad on a sensitive mission to Atlantis alongside Harley Quinn, Deadshot, Killer Croc, and the other addition, Master Jailer. And last but certainly not least is the guy with the most entertaining name to say that I have ever read, Hunky Punk. Hunky Punk here is a British supervillain who started off as a bored history teacher, Dorian Ashmore. Dorian, like a lot of us, was craving more adventure in his life, so you know what he did? He mounted an archaeological expedition to the ruins of a medieval church, which is totally cool. Now, once he was there, Dorian was awoken by a strange voice that led him to a very peculiar black dog. This dog then went on to explain that he was actually the spirit of an animal that was sacrificed by early Christian settlers and he was sentenced to guard the church forever. This spirit then offered the position to Dorian, telling him that it came with the benefit of immense powers. So naturally, he took it, becoming the hunky punk facing off against his enemy Mr. Albion and the Victory Vs. He would later end up up on the Suicide Squad when he infiltrated Belle Reve Prison under the guise of England being interested in Task Force X's program. But Amanda Waller saw right through his scheme and forced him to come on a mission alongside herself and Captain Boomerang to rescue the Suicide Squad in Germany. Once there, he and Boomerang saved Harley Quinn from cultists, but then, well, Hunky Punk got a hunky crossbow bolt to the eye, courtesy of Rose Tattoo, and now he's gone. At number 10 is Calendar Man. So you think you've heard all the villain origin stories, huh? Well, have you ever met Julian Day, the calendar man? This guy's obsession with time and dates would make even the most punctual person seem laid back. He'd celebrate holidays like nobody's business, but his calendar fixation led to some serious mental unraveling. You see, he dabbled in a life of crime with unique twists, pulling off heists tied to specific calendar dates. Batman, being the cape crusader he is, couldn't resist, and the two engaged in an ongoing dance of cat and mouse. But here's the twist. After some stints in Arkham Asylum, Julian somehow became a useful asset to Batman. He helped him crack the case of the Holiday Unaliver, a case that the Calendar Man himself was initially the prime suspect for. Nowadays, Julian's obsession has evolved into metahuman abilities as he ages and regenerates with the seasons. Winter brings wrinkles in spring. Well, it's like a youth serum turning him into a newer, younger version of himself. Just goes to show even the weirdest obsessions can lead to some unexpected expected supervillain stories. At number 9 is Ice Cream. So if you haven't heard of him, Ice Cream is a minor villain who only appeared in the obnoxious The Clown number 1 X-Men comic. Ice Cream is a mutant supervillain with the power to turn his entire body into any flavor of ice cream. That's right. In his ice cream form, he can change his shape, melting into a puddle to slip under a door. His costume is made of unstable molecules, so it can turn into ice cream along with him and then change back. His origin story is that people laughed at him because of his ridiculous powers, and he blamed the X-Men because their incredible powers made his look ridiculous in comparison. So he made a plan to destroy them so that everyone would respect him. He also made ice cream puns like Lickety Banana Split and Easy as Pie a la Mode. And at one point he even said curses like a typical cartoon villain. If you're enjoying the video so far, please
please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. And number eight is the Rainbow Rider. Roy G. Bivolo, aka the Rainbow Rider, is not your typical comic book villain. Growing up, Roy had dreams of becoming a famous artist, but there's a catch. He was colorblind. While other kids were out playing, Roy spent his time perfecting his craft, only to be met with disdain for his art due to his inability to see the true beauty of colors. But Roy's story takes an even darker turn. His father, an optometrist and optical tech expert, vowed to find a way to cure his son's condition. Tragically, he passed away before he could fulfill that promise. But before he could, Roy's father handed him a pair of goggles that he had been developing. These goggles had the power to emit solid rainbow colored light beams, which I mean, kind of misses the target a little bit. Fueled by bitterness over his failed artistic pursuits and his father's unfulfilled promise, Roy chose a different path. He embarked on a life of crime, using the goggles to create chaos and establish himself as the Rainbow Raider. At number seven is Shaggy Man. No, it's not Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, although I wish it was. This guy was actually a freaky creation of Dr. Andrew Zagarian, who was just trying to find a substitute for lost human tissue. He whipped up something called plastic alloy and decided to beef it up with a dash of salamander DNA. But here's where everything goes south for science. A big old human error occurred and this artificial body he was working on turned into a hulking hairy giant he cleverly named the Shaggy Man. No PhD required to see where this is going. The Shaggy Man goes bonkers attacking anything that moves. Plus it can regrow any body part that it loses thanks to its salamander DNA. The doctor was in way over his head and had to call in the Justice League for backup. But even then those superheroes couldn't handle this monstrosity, but leave it to the Flash to come up with a genius solution. He tells the doctor to create another Shaggy Man, and then they toss these immortal beasts into a deep pit where they're stuck battling each other for all eternity. Number six, Emperor Darth Revan. Darth Revan is an interesting one. Not many knew of the character's relevance as a Sith Lord due to the Sith history only being known, of course, to Sith cultists throughout the galaxy. As such, Revan's name was mainly unknown, lost to the sands of time. Revan Revan, however, would have a Stormtrooper Legion named after them because Fun fact! Stormtrooper legions are apparently typically named after Sith Lords, ancient Sith Lords. In truth, Revan was a former Jedi Knight who left the Order and ended up becoming the Dark Lord of the Sith. They formed a Sith Empire but eventually became an amnesiac who was retrained and indoctrinated into the Jedi Order, later actually used to fight against the very Sith Empire they had once built. Revan is actually the character that you play as in the game Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic and can be customized to look however you prefer them to look, with you also choosing Using their gender. In canon, however, Revan was established as male, with the light side ending of the game being established in lore as the canon ending. So just so you know that. Number five, Darth Talon. While I feel like female Sith Lords are weirdly rare, Talon is a great one who really makes up for the lack of quantity of Sith ladies with just straight up quality. Talon herself is visually striking, covered head to toe in Sith tattoos. Each of these tattoos were earned through ritual combat. She was the apprentice initially of Sith Lord Darth Ryan, but would betray him at the command of Dark Lord of the Sith, Emperor Darth Krayt, separating his head from his body with her lightsaber. As you know, a lot of Sith Lords love to do that. Talon would become one of two of Krayt's most loyal followers and apprentices, and when he was eventually defeated, she actually ended up going into hiding, continuing to operate in the shadows, striving to serve the needs and accomplish the goals of the One Sith, which is sometimes also known as the New Sith Order. Darth Talon was created by John Ostrander and Jan Dersema, and was first introduced in the Dark Horse comic series Star Wars Legacy. Number four, Ajunta Paul. Ajunta Paul was the first Dark Lord of the Sith. The very first one. Although being the first ruler of the first order of Siths, he did not have a Sith name that he was known by, at least not one that I was able to find, instead being simply known as just Ajunta Paul or Master Paul to his followers. As indicated by his title, Paul was once a Jedi and Jedi Master, a member of the Jedi Order. He began to study alchemy during his time as a Jedi and would discover how to create and shape life. Despite this impressive discovery, the Jedi Order did not celebrate Paul, but instead feared him and his newfound power deeming it as part of the dark side of the force and condemning him. For this, he was kicked out of the Jedi Order, who then attempted to basically erase the knowledge of his discoveries in order to prevent anyone else from tampering with this newfound power. Frustrated at having been judged and rejected, Master Paul and his followers declared war on the Order, beginning the period known in history as the Hundred Year Darkness. Paul comes from the Expanded Universe and I believe first appeared in the Dark Horse Star Wars comics. Number three, Darth 
Bane. Darth Bane, while perhaps not as well known in terms of Sith and Sith Lords, is actually quite an important Sith in terms of their history. He is the creator of the Rule of Two. The Rule of Two maintains that at all times there can only be two Sith, a master and their apprentice. Bane actually created the Rule of Two to protect the Sith after being the lone survivor of the Jedi Sith War. Bane believed that the Sith's competitive nature and their focus on destroying one another had ultimately weakened them to the point that, you know, he was the last one. So he created the Rule of Two to help them better, somewhat, work together, thereby preserving them and their beliefs. The Jedi Sith War happened about a thousand years prior to the events of the Clone Wars and resulted in almost all of the Sith being wiped out by the Jedi Order, save for Bane. The Rule of Two might seem like a small thing considering that it doesn't seem to, you know, greatly increase the Sith's numbers, only going from one Sith at the top to like two of them, but it actually was successful in prolonging their survival thousands of years into the future. After the death of Darth Bane, who was killed supposedly by his own apprentice, the Jedi believed they had succeeded in wiping out all of the Sith, and a thousand year era of peace was ushered in. However, his apprentice survived, becoming the new master. With the Jedi left unsuspecting, this actually allowed the Sith to plot in the shadows, spreading their influence throughout the galaxy and bolstering their power in secret. Darth Bane first appeared in Star Wars The Clone Wars. Number 2. Darth Xana Darth Xana is relatively unknown even within the world of Star Wars itself, but still serves a super important role in the continuation and evolution of the Sith. Xana was the apprentice of Darth Bane. She was trained to carry on the rules and teachings of Bane, including the self-preserving Rule of Two. We don't know much about her, or even really how she killed her master, but it's believed that she fought and killed Bane in a duel. Xana has only been mentioned a few select times in Star Wars media, and it's not only a mysterious figure to Star Wars fans, but also to characters within the world, as accurate historical records were, you know, not really kept in regards to her life and her story. She was actually first mentioned in the novel Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace by Terry Brooks, based off the film, of course, of the same name. He here, Darzana was first wrongfully referred to using the pronoun him, and this would actually later be corrected in other media where instead it would be established that Xana used the pronouns of she, her. Now we know Xana probably lady. Be cool to actually hear more about Darth Xana. I would be interested. Number one, Emperor Darth Vitiate. Darth Vitiate is quite the Sith. While to me Darth Vitiate is not as well known, if you go hard when it comes to Star Wars, there is a chance that this is a Sith Lord you might recognize thanks to his extensive history and his impressive feats. Truly this is a Sith Lord that earns the unstoppable part of this title. Darth Vitiate is the son of the Sith Lord Dramoth. Even growing up he showed a great penchant for power and influence, conquering his own village and people by the age of 10 on planet Madrius. Hearing of this, Lord Dramoth came to to see for himself what chaos his son had wrought and was killed by his son. Unafraid and filled with brazen confidence, Tenebrae as he was known at the time would end up making his way to Dark Lord of the Sith, Marco Regnos, where he would prove himself and be rewarded with the title of Sith Lord, becoming known as Lord Vitiate. He would also go on not just to become a Sith Lord, but also take for himself the title of Emperor. Vitiate would set out with his forces to once more find and reclaim the Sith homeworld of Droman Kaz, ushering in the new dawn for his Sith Emperor. Empire. Seeking complete immortality, Vitiate also sought to gain more power and in essence basically become a god, becoming probably one of the most ambitious Sith Lords we have ever ever known in Sith history. Vitiate and his empire were first alluded to in the video game Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic number 2, The Sith Lords. 